Good morning, everyone. As we wait for our participants to join us, uh, I would like to welcome everyone to our virtual town hall discussion that focuses on bridging the gap, reducing inequality in the Philippines for inclusive growth. I am uh, Dean Domanhit, president of Stratbase ADR Institute. And I would like to welcome everyone. And I also would like to welcome our speakers who are authors of our special policy papers that is part of our research project called Beyond the Crisis, a strategic agenda for the next president. Happy to have this morning, Dean Ron Mendoza of the Ateneo School of Government, Dr. C.P. David, a member of our board of trustees and our program convener in the areas of environment and natural resources. Dr. Justine Jokno Sika, part of a research fellow at the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, but also the president of the Philippine Economic Society. We're always proud that in ADR Institute, Strat-based ADR Institute, we bring different stakeholders of Philippine society together. So not only academics, public intellectuals, but even champions of the private sector. Happy to have Sir Francisco de Rosario, chairman of the Institute for Solidarity in Asia, and attorney Happy, Christopher Happy Tan, our partner in, in the private school Philippine Association of College and Universities, private school champion of educational reforms. You know, in Stratbase ADR Institute, we work with, with some of our research and intelligence unit within the Stratbase School. And since the start of the pandemic, we have identified what we call eight pandemic challenges. And as we live with this COVID-19 virus, as we try to move beyond this COVID-19 virus, it remains a challenge. How do we deal with the challenge of inequality in the Philippines? Because the pandemic really compounded generational disparity in income, jobs, and opportunities. As we track data with our partners, Social Weather Station and Pulse Asia, we have really taken note of the rise of hunger. It has, it has lowered down as we have gotten back to work, as we have allowed people to go back to work. We saw how it rose, how people experience hunger and have been nothing to eat. Even, you could say, once or really severe, often or always. That's a substantial number of Filipinos. And that we saw also the increase of poverty from where we were at the end of 2019, pre-pandemic, to where we are today, where 80% of Filipinos define themselves as poor. Poor could mean no income at all. Maybe majority have low income, and that affects their day-to-day -day lives. And it's something that we have tracked something that we have tracked, especially uh, entering an election season. We have started to track issues, core concerns of Filipinos since June of 2020. And what surprised us after six, seven surveys, national surveys, both Social Weather Station and Pulse Asia, even we were dealing with Delta strain, Omicron, it was the issue of economics that was the key concern of the Filipino people. They speak of inflation or pressure on belief. Gutom or kirapa, hunger and poverty. Due to low wages or no jobs at all. And when studying the policy environment, the needs of the Filipino people, pre-election campaign. This was what they responded. They need jobs. 
some of them have become underemployed during this pandemic because they have to deal with the prices, the rising prices of basic services and commodities. Imagine with all this news of high cost of gasoline, petroleum products, that would be more burden to the Filipino people. And because of this, we believe we need to address this generation and well, We have asked our research partners, proud of their product, proud of what they have come up with, because we need really to see how can we create jobs. Private sector is there to help us create jobs. How to uplift the lives of the Filipino out of poverty and expand livelihood opportunities. Government can only create that environment, but it's the private sector with the help of government, both foreign and domestic investors, that can create jobs. And when we try to dig deep into it, we notice how across demographics, 81% of Filipinos across geographic area looks at the private sector as a possible partner to help deal with infrastructure that cannot, can create jobs and even create better environment for investment that will create further jobs. But when you look at the growth of the economy, 82% of Filipinos believe that the private sector is key. So we need this whole of society approach to address the challenge of generational inequality. The answer does not lie only in our presidential candidates or whoever that government is. We have seen how inequality, an accepted reality in the lives of 80% of Filipinos has been exacerbated by COVID-19 pandemic. From unemployment, underemployment, closure of business, alarming rates of inflation that we're experiencing now, and other economic insecurities. Only a small segment of society was prepared to deal with an unexpected shock as massive as the pandemic that we have experienced the past two years. We need to promote inclusive growth. That is what we would like to share to the general public. That's why we are pushing for these policy positions, policy papers. That as inequality persists in the Philippines, it requires a multi-stakeholder strategy. That's why today we're hoping that this over 200 registrants for this virtual town hall discussion can be part of this multi-stakeholder approach to championing, promoting, sustaining inclusive growth for the Filipino people. We need public-private partnerships, investments by the private sector, creating of better environment for investment by the incoming administration by June 30, 2022, with the hope that it can provide jobs, improve livelihood and income, and a comfortable life for many Filipinos in the long run. Government, and we ask government, to provide a conducive environment for the private sector to thrive as an effective partner to government in making public services available, especially to those who need help the most. Again, thank you. Good morning for joining us, for our speakers. Thank you so much for our participants. Hope you can learn from all our discussions this morning. I turn this on now to Papa, our executive director. Thanks, Prof. Manhit. So um, thank you again, Professor Manhit, the president of Strat-Based Indian Art Institute, um, uh, for setting the stage for today's discussion. Uh, Professor Manit said, I'm Paco Pangalangan. I'm the Executive Director of Strat-Based in the ADR Institute. And I'll be serving as your moderator uh, uh, for today's uh, program. Uh, first of all, I would like to personally um, welcome you also as well to today's Strat-Based ADRI virtual town hall discussion on bridging the gap, uh, reducing inequality in the Philippines for inclusive growth. Uh, now that we've heard from Professor Manit, Next, we'll be hearing from a few of our um, speakers, uh, Dean Juan Mendoza, Dr. Justine uh, Jokmosikat, uh, Dr. C.P. David, 
then we'll be hearing some of uh, the stakeholder perspectives, in particular from Mr. Habitat and Mr. Uh, Francisco de Rosario. Then later on, we'll have some time for an open forum. Um, and this means this is an opportunity for everybody, all of our participants, both on uh, here in Zoom and those watching on Facebook Live, to send in your questions that we'll try to get to and ask uh, of our of our of our panel. So with that, now that I've gotten through a bit of the house rules, uh, I do want to introduce our first speaker. So today's forum, we're really gathered. We've gathered the most distinguished academics and business leaders to discuss the perennial issue of economic inequality and the future of inclusive growth. In this first part of the discussion, we will focus on how public policy can be an effective tool to combat inequality. Uh, our first speaker is none other than uh, the Dean of Ateneo School of Government, Dr. Ronald Mendoza, who is a governance and institutional reform specialist with over 25 years of experience in development policy and public administration reform. Presently, he is the Dean and, and is a professor of economics at the school, Ateneo School of Government. Dean Ron, good morning. Good morning, Paco. Should I go ahead and present now? Please do, please. Yes, uh, sir. Please allow me to share screen. Okay. First of all, thank you very much to Dindo, Paco, uh, Christine, our good friends in ADRI for the kind invitation to join you and to be part of this very important project. Uh, when uh, Dindo called me late last year um, to pitch the project to me, I, I was very, very happy for the reach out and uh, more than happy to collaborate. Uh, and of course, uh, Dindo knows I have been working on inequality and its different dimensions for the past decade or so. So this is also in a way sort of a synthesis of work we've been doing in AIM and in Ateneo School of Government. Uh, I only have 10 minutes, so I'll try to go through this uh, quite efficiently and I'll proceed if you let me. First, uh, the topic for today is inequality and uh, based on our research, we find three uh, different facets of inequality affecting the Philippines in a deep way. And we find that this um, in very real ways trap us in what we call an inequality trap, right? The first uh, aspect of inequality is the weak upward mobility we observe uh, in the Philippines uh, economy. Um, and there are two main reasons for this. One is we don't have enough decent jobs for our young people. Um, and many of us know this, there's about over a million young people joining our labor force every year. And uh, we are not producing uh, you know, more than a million uh, jobs every year. So therefore there is a deficit that we are basically piling up over time. And those are the underemployed and the unemployed. In order to actually give them better prospects for upward mobility, the kind that actually empowers a strong middle class, we really need to produce more high quality jobs, high paying jobs uh, in the country. Uh, and uh, this is where uh, the advocacy of ADRI and even our Ateneo Policy Center coincides with really a smart uh, strategic way of opening up, uh, increasing foreign investments, uh, having all these partnerships uh, with the private sector. Uh, and of course, uh, that's our hope, but the reality is not often reflective of this hope. Second aspect of that is the disaster prone nature of the Philippines. I'm sure you've seen the reports. We are among the most uh, disaster affected countries in the world. And therefore a big chunk of our population often gets hit back. They're already in the low income or middle income situation and they get hit, hit back, slapped back into poverty or low income status uh, with each shock, be it a financial shock, a rice price shock, a food uh, price shock, a pandemic, uh, you name it. And uh, that's not even acknowledging the typical health shocks that many middle-income Filipinos still face. And I'm very, very happy that ADRI also has an advocacy in this area to build a more inclusive universal healthcare uh, system. Um, the second aspect is, uh, and it's very much linked to the first one, is political concentration of power among political clans, political dynasties. Now, this is really the main work I've been doing uh, for the past decade uh, it started in AIM, now we're continuing it in Ateneo Policy Center. And the main idea here is that the voice of the people is not necessarily reflected in the policies and in the governance uh, in, our, um, in our public sector. And so the uh, amount of change, the extent of reform that we are seeing 
does not necessarily match the challenge and the ambition uh, reflected by the first challenge, which is weak upward mobility. So uh, political concentration of power, uh, and I'll be very candid later on, uh, those who are in power, elected in office, may not necessarily have their interests aligned with deep reforms. In fact, many of them face deep conflict of interest in terms of changing the present status quo. They benefit from the present status quo. So why would they change it? So this is, this is one big challenge. And then finally, and it's very much linked to why all of these uh, sort of leaders spend so much money and mobilize all of their cronies and allies to basically win office every three years is because of the economic concentration and the availability of rent in our economy. Due to heavy regulation, due to uh, the relatively closed nature of still some of our sectors, uh, but also because of bad governance and, and lack of competitiveness. There, there is a, a way to keep on concentrating economic power when you don't have a level playing field. And it brings back to mind um, one of our early presidents in the post-EDSA period, uh, President uh, Fidel Ramos. And uh, one of his big reforms then was to level the playing field, get foreign investments in, but also enhance competitiveness so that the investors do come in and provide that competition uh, that we all sort of aspire for. Um, so if you have this kind of a situation, they're all interlinked. Uh, and uh, you know, in our papers, in our studies recently, we've argued that inequality in the Philippines is sort of a self-reinforcing trap. Because of the economic concentration, a lot of uh, political leaders spend so much money to actually hold on to that ability to control rent that uh, therefore is sort of a lucrative activity for them. They therefore uh, seek to concentrate political power and stay in power in order to control that rent. Because of that kind of a system, you don't have the strong uh, upward mobility as a result for the vast majority of uh, our citizens. So this is sort of that self-reinforcing loop. I won't belabor these points. Probably you've seen this uh, in previous presentations and maybe even in our um, you know, articles that we've released, but essentially this is what the income distribution for the country looks like, uh, and it is one of a highly unequal country. And do not be surprised that uh, part of the challenge right now of understanding what is happening in the messaging for our elections is that one group finds it very, very difficult to talk to the other group and to understand where they are coming from, why they are more likely to vote for someone uh, who comes from a political plan that is associated with basically one of the biggest economic disasters we've ever seen, uh, which is the Marcos dictatorship. Um, why uh, are uh, a big chunk of our people sort of voting for the scion of this particular political plan? Why are they not voting for a continuity of reforms uh, of many of which we have started in the post-EDSA period, but uh, may now actually be uh, you know, subject to validation with this election. So there are discussions right now. I've been in uh, recent forums uh, suggesting that this may be the end of the post-EDSA reform period if we actually go back to uh, sort of a nostalgia, what I would call a false nostalgia of, uh, you know, strongman rule and uh, taking shortcuts and again, weakening institutions. So, so I think there, there's a lot to be said uh, about that division, but uh, in a nutshell, I want to show you the economic side of it, which is uh, not very surprising that we are divided because we are very unequal as a country right now. And the ability to speak to each other, to find common ground, it's showing in our politics right now. And uh, it's mirrored in our economics as well. So I, I told you earlier that uh, part of the challenge is the vulnerability, the inequality in resilience against shocks. Some of us with the ability to withstand many shocks or we will just shrug off many crises, shocks that affect us. Maybe some of us are affected by the pandemic, but not as, as big as um, sort of the effects in other uh, families who are uh, low income and poor. And just to show you the inequality and resilience, th these are the latest calculations of our poverty headcount in the Philippines. And we managed to reduce poverty by about 4.1 million Filipinos between 2015 and 2018. Unfortunately, uh, and this is in the backs of uh, reforms that we all know we've celebrated, the credit upgrades, the fast growth, 
fastest growing Asian economy in cer certain quarters uh, in 2018 and 2019, I think. But now uh, that we have undergone uh, the two years of the pandemic in 2020 and 2021, well into uh, the lingering effects and risks in 2022, uh, there, is been, there has been an increase in poverty by about 3.6 million between 2018 uh, and 2021. And uh, sadly, the, the result of this is we have nearly wiped out the gains since 2015. It's as if you did not have uh, almost any poverty reduction between 2015 and 2021. Uh, and why is that? Because of uh, the unequal resilience and the vulnerability of are recently emancipated poor. They were not poor, they slide back into poverty. They therefore add to the poverty rolls. And so I listen a lot to the political scientists. Uh, Dean Jalaiti Hanke is one of my idols um, doing research uh, in this area. And, and there, there is a lot to be uh, researched in terms of the sentiments, uh, the behaviors and the vulnerability of our middle class. This is not an empowered and emancipated middle class. This is still a highly vulnerable middle class that can slide into poverty uh, with shocks. So uh, as I mentioned, political concentration, maybe I'll just go through this very quickly, Paco, uh, since I only have 10 minutes. Uh, you've probably seen this before with so many times I presented uh, in the last 10 years. Uh, Tin dynasty, nagsusunod sunod, fat dynasty, nagsasabay sabay. You ask uh, anyone working in governance, why is it not good for governance kung nagsabay sabay sila? Well, checks and balances just go out the window. No? If you have a, um, a simultaneous occupy, occupying of uh, elected office for such a big political clan. Uh, and it is actually, I think, quite unique to the Philippine situation. There are dynasties in many other countries, but not as many uh, as in the Philippines. And I'll show you next. If you look at the local governments, 80% of governors, 67% of congressmen, and 53% of mayors belong to fat dynasties. Fat dynasties are those we define as two and above family members in office. If we actually define all dynasties, you know, the fat and the thin, probably there would be almost no one left in the local okay. government who is not a dynasty. So th this is uh, increasing over time. They're crowding out. Uh, fat dynasties are crowding out thin dynasties and the non-dynasties. And we expect further consolidation of political power in many places in the country just because of the nature of power and wealth and that inequality which I described to you earlier. Uh, so if you, if you see this, uh, it's very, very difficult to imagine that there will be change if uh, the concentration of political power is actually becoming worse and worse. How will the voice of the people and the interest of the people get into a situation in a, a picture like this? So just to give you an example of what happens when you have a fat dynasty, this is one elected leader uh, in, in a province, uh, sorry, a, a clan in a province in the country. I will not name the, the, <laughs> the family anymore, uh, but uh, they had um, three family members in office in 2004 and eight family members in office by 2019. And meanwhile, the poverty in that province uh, almost doubles. Uh, or, or uh, actually doubles uh, because of um, basically bad governance and the concentration of power uh, that I mentioned. So the, the question then would be, it's an empirical question for us uh, social scientists, what do you do with that concentration of political power? And the answer typically is, you don't pursue the public interest, you don't pursue the common good, you actually behave in ways that are more geared towards impunity and making mistakes. Why? because you don't get corrected by the people when you make mistakes. You still get elected over and over again. And this in a snapshot is the micro picture of dictatorship, if you ask me. If you put this snapshot in Malacanang and you put a fat political clan back in office in Malacanang, this is exactly you know, the, the likelihood that you will see uh, uh, one par par particular clan dominating political power again that's most likely going to be the, the effect. Uh, it's quite acute right now in the provinces in the Philippines. And this is one of the, uh, if you ask me, a big failure of the reforms in the post-EDSA period. And this is why so many people feel disgruntled about the past 30 years that did not produce the inclusive development we all 
hoped for. There were good uh, things that we achieved, but there were also many, many uh, things that we failed to achieve. This is one of them. Uh, building a more inclusive democracy. We, uh, in a nutshell, and I keep on repeating this to every group that I meet these days, we managed to begin to liberalize our economy, but we failed miserably to liberalize our politics. Uh, and eventually, even if you liberalize your economy, even if you're one of the fastest growing Asian economies in some quarters, you will still hit a ceiling because of bad governance and because of that failure uh, to liberalize politics. So economic concentration, I'll just skip this in the interest of time, but we have been ranked yet again uh, by The Economist and other groups as one of the most crony capital friendly countries in the world uh, where uh, we're actually ranked in the top five. Uh, in terms of crony capitalism. And this just explains that third aspect of inequality I mentioned, that we are still a heavily concentrated uh, economy in some sectors. In other sectors, we have become much more competitive. There are some recent victories, including the liberalization uh, that has been pushed under the Duterte administration. But I would argue that in order not to create the pushback from this liberalization, we should also strengthen our institutions uh, and our regulations so that we are able to extract more of the good and uh, less of the bad from such a, a more open uh, economic environment. Uh, and finally, I want to end with this more hopeful note uh, in this uh, paper that uh, Dindo asked me to do. Um, I wanted to outline what could be a reform agenda for not just for the next administration, but maybe for the next three uh, administrations trying to get us through maybe the next decade or two decades uh, into some of these difficult uh, reforms, right? Uh, and I will cite here three main aspects uh, which we can uh, focus on uh, based on the diagnosis that I shared with you earlier. And the three sets of reform have to do with building a more inclusive society through stronger social protections, stronger social insurance uh, mechanisms, making sure that uh, you have a middle class that is actually well protected, doesn't just slide back into poverty. And also waking us up to the reality that it's not just poverty reduction anymore. We have a large middle class that has its own interests. And so therefore, if all your rhetoric is poverty reduction, they may actually tune out and not agree with the uh, sort of reform agenda because they're not poor anymore. Uh, and, but their challenge is they're still vulnerable and can end up in poverty or low income status. So talking about the OFWs, talking about the grab uh, drivers, talking about all those uh, daily workers who go to work every day who are not necessarily mathematically, technically poor, but are still quite vul vulnerable. Upward social mobility is the other part of this equation. We need to produce more decent jobs. If we're doing a better job in social protection, education, uh, in other aspects of human capital investments, I'm not saying it's perfect, but we have been trying to ramp it up. Uh, we, we should get our economy ready to absorb all these young people. Otherwise, we'll just continue to send them abroad and we'll, we'll have a hollow economy actually uh, from this kind of a, of a situation. So creating the decent jobs within our borders, in our country, and creating new growth engines spread across the country, particularly in the South, uh, will be critical here. Inclusive democracy, I won't uh, belabor that point anymore. We need to regulate dynasties, build strong political parties, uh, and maybe even implement campaign finance reforms because of all these new technologies. And finally, the inclusive economy uh, aspect, and I'm an economist, so I'm expected to also weigh in on this. We need to continue to improve competition. So this is good that we do have uh, some kind of strategy to continue to open up, but we do need to open up uh, with a fair amount of strategy behind it. We cannot just open up to the competition, but not have our supply side ready for that competition. Uh, and that's really the unequalizing pattern of our opening up and liberalization. We sign all these agreements, lower our tariffs, uh, lower our uh, protections on the border. And when the products come in, our ability to boost our own supply side is weak. And why is it weak? Because of bad governance. And why is it badly governed because we did not liberalize the political system. That part is the difficult part of industrialization. The opening up is actually the sign of a pen, you know, tariff reduction and all of that. The difficult part that many of the East Asian tigers managed to do 
is this supply side response. And that probably will not happen for us until we fix our governance and liberalize our politics. Thank you so much for the chance to share these views. And I hope uh, I contributed to the discussion today. Thank you, Dean Ron. Again, very insightful. Uh, I'm very happy again to be able to listen to your to your talk. It's very a lot of a lot of data and a lot of interesting perspectives on on the inequality problems that we're facing today. I think uh, what really stuck out to me is, is of course that uh, that self reinforcing trap of inequality that we're in now. And of course, uh, I really encourage everybody to to look into the paper that. Dean Ron published with the Institute and, and the policy recommendations that he had um, to address that, that weak upward mobility and the political and economic concentration issues that the country is facing now. So thank you, Dean Ron, again. Uh, at this point, I'd like to, to shift over to, to our next speaker. Uh, oh, okay. Our next speaker uh, is uh, Dr. Justine, Charlotte Justine Jok Musika. Uh, she actually sent in a recording for us today. Um, which will be playing, but uh, Dr. Justine Sikat is uh, is a research fellow at the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, or PIDS, and is the president of the Philippine Economic Society. She was also an assistant professor at the UP uh, Cesar Virata School of Business. Um, so here we go. We have her video here, and she'll be talking about promoting an investment-driven economy through good governance. Good morning, everyone, and thank you to ADR Institute Stratlings for inviting me this morning to the town hall to share my opinions on bridging the gap, reducing inequality in the Philippines for inclusive growth. In 2022, there will be major shifts in Philippine governance, as we all know. There will be a new president, a new administration, new nationally and locally elected officials. Policymakers will still be managing the now endemic COVID-19 while trying to sustain the 5.3% recovery in 2021 from the economic contraction of 9.5% in 2020, as you can see on the graph to the right of the screen. With public debt ratio increasing from 39.6% in 2019 to 60.5% in 2021, there is a need for prudent and strategic spending to pump prime the economy, to outgrow debt. And finally, there will be a redevolution with the implementation of the Mandanas Garcia Supreme Court ruling that will impact fiscal space. This ruling effectively broadens the base on which to compute the intergovernmental fiscal transfers of local government units, now known as the national tax allotment. Now, what is the question that I will try to answer today? How do we bridge the gap and reduce inequality for inclusive governance? And I'll provide several possible answers. There should be improved and innovative public sector governance. First, fiscal consolidation of the national government is a must. Second, strategic investment in both physical and human capital, physical capital being infrastructure and human capital being education, training, and including social protection and health of both national and local governments are needed. This will all encourage private sector participation at all levels. Now, just to align, uh, we'll begin with some definitions on what institutions are, governance and innovation as in the context of this morning's presentation. According to the Nobel Prize winning economist, Oliver Williamson, a nation's formal and informal institutions, which are the rules of the game, are the foundation for governance, which is the play of the game. Innovation is a new, new or significantly improved service, communication method, or process organizational method, according to the Oslo Manual. In the public sector, innovation is the implementation of a significant change in the way the organization operates or in the products it provides. They comprise new or significant changes, services and goods, operational processes, organizational methods, or the way organization communicates with users. Now, the three levels I mentioned earlier on innovative public sector governance, let's focus first on national government. Because of the COVID-19 pandemic, there was a drastic increase in the budget deficit from 2.4% in 2019 
to 8.1% in 2020. You can see this on the right side of the slide and the, 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 the considerable surge here in expenditures is what triggers the uh, drop in the budget deficit here. In the medium term, and as the economy and revenues recover, coupled with the need for government to spend to jumpstart the economy, there will be continued need for borrowing. Now the national government needs to strategize fiscal consolidation by balancing this with the need to recover the economy through both physical infrastructure and human capital investments to address scarring. Now on the level of local governments, there's also a need for innovative innovative public sector governance. First, the implementation of the Mandana's Supreme Court ruling translated into a 38% increase in the local government national tax allotment, NTA, which I mentioned earlier, of about 263.5 billion, totaling 959 billion, which is about almost 20% of the 2022 budget of 5.024 trillion. And as you can see here, the share of the national tax allotment to national government expenditures surged in 2022. Now, local governments should contribute to economic recovery by strategically utilizing the adjustment in their national tax allotment by first, improved planning and investment program. Second, by ensuring that they spend the increased transfers that they will be receiving by implementing these programs. And third, to look for alternative means of providing goods and services, including interlocal government unit arrangements or engagements with the private sector. Now, on the last aspect of innovative public sector governance would be the cross-cutting issues and institutions. There is a need for institutional innovations which cut across the public sector, such as investments in data and information systems and harnessing digitalization. First, we must invest in information systems to have updated and shared databases that would help deliver public services. Now, examples of this would be fast tracking the implementation of the national ID. And in the case of the LGUs or local government units, the full blown implementation of the community-based monitoring system app. This would enhance the information available to policymakers that would need to implement uh, policies. Now, Innovations in pub providing public goods and services are also needed. These could be through alternative arrangements, such as inter-LGU, both horizontal and vertical cooperation, as well as national and local government alignment and collaboration. Are, these are the perfect vehicles for the common goal of inclusive growth and development. And finally, harnessing digitalization. Though this requires a whole of society approach, and provides a major role for the private sector con uh, for the private sector to contribute to or to participate in to sustain economic recovery. This requires laying the foundations in infrastructure and systems, as mentioned above, continued implementation of the current program, medium term information and communi communications technology harmonization initiative, or METI, which is in the national budget, it has been for the past two years, which is government's effort to improve government online platforms to deliver better services. Investments also in human capital are necessary. These are to upskill and retool workers and enhance technical capacities for workers to learn the new technologies in current work or prepare workers for new jobs coming about because of the shift to digitalization and other digital platforms. For the financial sector, the Banco Central ng Pilipinas goal of converting 50% of the total volume of retail payments into digital form and onboard at least 70% of Filipino adults to the financial system through the opening of a transactions account that can be used for a payment system. In all these, the private sector could be partners. Businesses and civil society could work with government by providing solutions to pain points in the proposed priority areas. Now, some final remarks particularly for the next administration, of course. There should be no policy reversals nor any major institutional disruptions that would impact the government's revenue raising capacity or spending capacity. And 
we have a forthcoming study on debt at the IDS, and there is evidence to show that we are on track and that debt is manageable. So this is very crucial that there be no policy reversals in the new administration. Second, in bridging the gap and reducing inequality in the Philippines for inclusive growth, every single Filipino has a role to play. So thank you very much. All right, thanks, uh, Dr. Justine Jokmosikat, um, for your talk on promoting an investment-driven economy through good governance. I think what really stuck out to me most was what, what Dr. Jokmosikat was saying about the need for improved and innovative public sector governance. Uh, and um, with that, uh, I'd like to move on to, to our next speaker. I see that, that he's here now. Uh, Next up, uh, we have, and I, it's a pleasure to introduce, Ms. Uh, Dr. Carlo Primo C.P. David. Uh, C.P. David is a licensed geologist and a professor at the National Institute for Geo Geological Sciences at the University of the Philippines, Diliman. Uh, he obtained his uh, master's in geology from the same university and in 2003 uh, received his PhD in environmental science and geology from Stanford uh, University. More importantly, uh, Dr. CP is also the, the, convene, the convener of a Philippine business for environmental stewardship and a trustee and program convener of Stratbase ADR Institute. Um, Dr. CP will be uh, talking about improving the Philippine agriculture sector by establishing food production areas. Uh, Dr. David? Are you here? Uh, if you can give me a minute, let's let's try. There might be some technical difficulties that uh, our speakers are experiencing. Let me. All right. Let me see what I can do. Okay. First, I'll send them a quick message. So if you can all, I'm I'm sure we're all used to this by now. Uh, given all the Zoom meetings that we're in. Uh, so maybe if we could give him just like a few seconds, let's see if he can connect, reconnect. Um, but in the meantime, I'd like to remind all of our participants that uh, if you have any questions, you can actually use the Q&A function of Zoom, which you can find at the bottom right corner if you're on the desktop. And you can just type your questions out there. Um, we have a team actually here in Stratton's PDR Institute that's organizing this uh, forum for us. And they're actually collecting these questions, the questions that you send through the Q&A function, as well as those that you send through email or through the Facebook Live uh, that we're also um, holding simultaneously and in parallel. Um, so once you've those questions have all been collected. When we get to the Q and A, we'll make sure to ask them. I see some movement on on the on the square of, <laughs> of Doctor David, so I think the the technical issues have been resolved. Sorry, sorry Paco, about that. <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. Yeah. I think, I think all I was of a able sudden, when it was my turn, uh, I can hear everything but can't unmute and uh, open my camera. But I hope I'm coming in. Loud and yeah. clear this time? Loud and clear. Loud and clear. All right. <laughs> Sorry again about that. Let me share my screen. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> okay. Can you see it? Can you go to the first slide, Dr. David? Are you on the first slide now? Yes. Are you seeing my title slide? Yes. Yes, I can see it. It says uh, Philippine agriculture productivity All and right. quest for okay. food sufficiency. Okay, thanks. I think we're, we're good. So good morning, everybody. Thanks, Paco and Lindo, once again, for inviting me to be part of the collection of papers that, that is quite timely. You know, and we are uh, doing all these research ADR Institute did this was exactly six years ago 
in uh, 2016, and I wrote about the environment and uh, energy sector at that time. For this year, I decided to write about agriculture. I'm a geologist uh, by profession, scientist, professor, and so I did this research as a complete outsider, looking at the sector that has ailed all these years. And my strategy was to look at it uh, precisely as an outsider, looking at data, so hard data and strategies that other countries have taken and have been successful in uplifting their agriculture sector. Okay, now keeping in line with our theme this morning on inequality, this figure here from the Ateneo shows the largest inequality I see in our economic sectors. This uh, table here shows you the different economic sectors uh, on the left side. And what it shows you is their contributions in our GDP. And then the blue bars for each sector shows you the contribution uh, of employment of each and every sector. Essentially, what this is showing us is that the most productive sectors, the ones that are providing uh, the largest percentage of GDP for the country are the sectors that employ our manpower the least. And at the very bottom, you can see agriculture there employing almost 30% of the manpower in the Philippines, yet contributing to a little bit more than 10% of our GDP. Now, this is a very, very powerful uh, figure to me because it simply tells us that there are inefficiencies in agriculture and the other sectors that are quite at the bottom of the list. It also tells us that moving forward, the inequality in terms of um, in terms of widening the income gap between people coming from various economic sectors will be much wider in the future. And unfortunately, our farmers and fisher folk, which uh, are, are most employed you know, by, by this sector, are contributing less in terms of GDP, which translates to them having the least uh, in terms of income per family. So this I think is a major problem. What are the problems that I saw with the agriculture sector? I think first and foremost, everyone has to accept that starting in the 1950s and the 1960s, our leaders, even nationalists, have branded agriculture as a third world endeavor and opted for industrialization at the expense of strengthening the agriculture sector. Note that first world countries like the United States and even the EU, the entire EU, which, which are uh, well-developed nations, still had a, a viable and healthy agriculture sector. No? So it, it was not, uh, at that time, not a, an option between industrialization and agriculture because these two should go hand in hand. For some reason, our leaders 50, 60 years ago thought that we have to abandon agriculture in order for us uh, to improve in our economic standing. Next, agrarian reform solved the social inequities of our time, meaning having farmers not owning the land, but unfortunately it also resulted in the inefficiencies in food production. Fast forward to 2022, most of the farmers that have been provided land because of agrarian reform, starting with a couple of hectares, two, three, even four hectares at the start, have now since retired and have given these lands to their uh, offsprings, no, sa mga anak nila, and which have cut down the, the size of the farms even smaller uh, among them. No? And uh, fast forward to today, farmers are now farming a little 
close to just one hectare per farmer per household uh, today. Agriculture is uh, requires a lot of scale, as you can see from farms in other countries. One farmer through mechanization, for example, can farm 20, 30, even 50 hectares just by himself. Now, we thought that it was mechanization that would solve our problems, but the truth of the matter is that mechanization, if you are farming just one hectare, does not work. No, there's no need to have tractors and all these equipment farm implements if, if you are only to farm one hectare. Our cooperative system has not work as uh, much as we want it to work. And therefore we are left with smallholder farms with one hectare each. And I believe it is not mechanization that uh, will solve it, but in, instead looking at how efficiently uh, smallholder farms can produce food and to earn from it. Finally, <clears throat> because of the inefficiencies in this sector, our dependence on food importation is at its highest and will continue to be a problem. Just think of any disruption in, in the value chain, you know, starting with production from other countries, that they have to increase that uh, the price of commodities and the brunt of the, the problem will have to be shouldered by those who are buying uh, these commodities. The next slide I will show you just uh, a few uh, facts I have gathered in terms of total importation in 2020 uh, for various commodities. And I included not just the, the big ones, no, the big ticket items, commodities that we import year in and year out, such as wheat, because we do not produce wheat. We cannot produce wheat because of climate. At the same time, uh, we need scale you know, to produce wheat and yet, no, we have to eat bread. And therefore, that is uh, the total importation we had in 2020, $1.5 billion. What I cannot accept, however, are other commodities such as salt. Being a, an archipelagic nation, we actually import salt uh, in 2020 to the amount of $28.8 million. Rice because of the inefficiencies in rice production in the country. We are now reliant on rice coming from our uh, neighboring countries like Thailand and Vietnam, uh, for whom we actually trained their agriculturists you know, 20, 30 years ago. Another item that uh, one has to uh, look into would be the dairy products like milk, $635 million. And this just tells us that our dairy production is not enough, but also looking at uh, other commodities that we should be able to produce ourselves. Mushrooms, $2.8 million. No onions and garlic, $40.6 million, and so on and so forth. So this is just a huge problem in terms of food security and in terms of uh, economic, economic terms, uh, we are at the mercy of uh, the producers, the countries that produce these commodities because we have been totally dependent on them. What is my recommendation for the agriculture sector? My recommendation is what I call as a self-contained food production area. It consists of industrial farms and therefore large swaths of land uh, that are farmed uh, with a lot of mechanization, coupled with surrounding it, smallholder farms, those one to two hectare farms that actually operate together with industrial farms, but not uh, independent of it. Within the food production area, there has to be a farm school for training the next generation farmers and food producers, because this is one other issue that I see in the sector, wherein obviously because you are not earning a lot from agriculture, then 
many people shy away from this sector and therefore we have to revive that by establishing farm schools and last but not least together with the private sector processing plants within that self-contained area. Where do we get these large uh, swaths of land? What I found is that the largest holders of contiguous farm lot areas are not the big uh, private companies because of uh, agrarian reform. Uh, there is no consolidation of, of uh, farm areas. However, the government through state universities, every time a state university is created, they are provided a land grant, some getting 250 hectares, the state university I'm currently working with has 60 hectares of land. Uh, and the number of state universities, and they're scattered in all provinces of the country, total to 118, most of which have agriculture as one of their courses. And therefore, we have experts in there. There is already a farm school uh, to speak of. There are a lot of smallholder farms that surround uh, these state universities, and all we need is to put in a processing plant within those state universities, these are government lands, and start farming at an industrial scale. You have the expertise, you have uh, smallholder farms that can join in, in that, that production, and last but not least, the private sector entering uh, into partnership by putting up processing plants. The strategic location of farms is also very important because obviously, as everyone knows, a lot of our farms that are uh, productive are in cool weather areas such as Baguio City and Tagaytay and some parts of Mindanao. To me, these areas are super critical in terms of development. And therefore, what I've done in the paper is to actually pinpoint where are these other cool weather areas of the country. And these are uh, at, at the top of my list, areas where we have to develop uh, food production areas. And finally, food production areas, no? again, combine commercial production at the industrial scale with smallholder farms, uh, training, as well as food processing and storage. You know, I believe that through this strategy, we can start realizing actually the initial idea of government, the one town, one product idea. This I think should be the foundation of that. You know, to me, a one town, one product concept is not that one town produces just uh, uraro or produces ube. Uh, ube jam, you know, but instead it has to be solid, solidly founded on a particular raw material that is being produced. And you can only produce that raw material at the cheapest price possible if it is at scale. This is the recommendation I have for the next administration. I actually no longer believe in a countrywide reform and and that an overnight change in our economic and political uh, sectors will happen. No? Uh, but instead, I espouse the idea of pockets of innovation and development. And in terms of food production, this is the strategy that I would like to recommend, you know, self-contained food production areas. I hope the next administration picks up a thing or two from this, this paper. And at the same time for the audience uh, in today's uh, town hall meeting, I hope that I've provided you some idea of how we can get to the next level in terms of increasing food production in the country and making sure that we are secure in terms of food in the coming years and generations of Filipinos to come. Maraming salamat, Paco and Linda. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Dr. CB. Those were great points. Uh, what really stuck out to me was you know, how you really emphasize, right, that that you know internal food reliance um, will not only you know provide food security but also it increases competitiveness um, and it will really help create jobs that will you know help the areas of the country that that need it most. I think uh, so. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. C. I hope we can 
uh, have you later for some questions during the open forum. Um, but at, at this point, I would like to now uh, go to our next speaker. Um, so th this is actually technically what we like to call like part two of the program. And part two of the program, uh, we'll hear from business uh, voices about the importance of multi-sectoral approach to generating inclusive economic growth. Uh, the pervasiveness of economic inequality in the Philippines means that no single agent or sector possesses the answers. Therefore, it is, it is particularly important to listen to a variety of opinions on the issue. Uh, first up, we have actually, um, we have is uh, Mr. Christopher Happy Tan. Uh, and Happy, Happy Tan is the, the Chief Operating Officer of FINMA Education. He was the former regional CEO for Asia of the uh, Grameen Foundation, a global nonprofit organization, and has worked for financial institutions uh, such as Shore Bank Advisory uh, Services, the local initiative support corp, uh, uh, corporation, and Sabiga, a legal resource non-government organization. Mr. Tan has over 20 years of experience in development finance, nonprofit management, and public interest law. He is also a board member of the Philippine Association of Colleges and Universities. Uh, Mr. Tan will be talking about improving Filipinos' quality of life through education reforms. Um, Mr. Tan, good, good morning. The floor is yours. Morning. Thank you. Um, could, could, uh, could you put it on um, uh, the wide view, please? Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning. FINMA Education is a network of colleges and universities in the Philippines and Indonesia with a total population of about 95,000 students, mostly in college and senior high school. Of our nine schools in the Philippines, eight are focused on the needs of low-income students. By low income, we mean that 70% of our students come from households that earn between 15,000 to about 25,000 pesos per month. As Dr. Mendoza said, uh, they are not poor, uh, but it only takes one unexpected medical emergency, a poor harvest, an additional three months of lockdown uh, to pull them down to uh, poverty levels. Uh, this morning, we'd like to share our experiences in understanding and grappling with the key problems that low-income students face. Uh, but just to qualify a bit, we're focusing first on the challenges of college students, uh, not yet basic ed. Basic ed involves its own complex set of issues, um, and, and we're not yet ready for that. Uh, there, um, and these three problems are not the only problems that our students face. There are, there are a lot more. Uh, and nor are they unchanging. Uh, these problems tend to evolve over time. However, we think that any policy prescription towards inequality uh, to address inequality in the Philippines needs to be able to address uh, these three issues. So next slide, please. So the problems are access, completion, and employment. So for access, the core market failure uh, in the Philippine educational sector is the lack of supply of high quality, low cost education. Uh, if you look at the providers of education to schools in the country and you pick the ones that offer good quality, they are the ones, not surprisingly, that uh, charge high tuition fees. And you really don't need to look at the usual suspects like Ateme or the Sal, where a, a year of education would run to hundreds of thousands of pesos. Even a local private university in Laguna that charges a much more modest 60,000 pesos per cent is unreachable and unsustainable to the vast majority of Filipino students. On the flip side, you have public universities that may offer solid and free education, uh, but their capacity to absorb students is very low. Uh, they need to be selective, and as a result, they conduct admissions exams. And you end up with what we can refer to as the UP dilemma, right? free tuition, but the demographic profile of their students are pract practically the same as Atene and Lasal. Uh, so in it's because in general, those who are able to pass admissions tests are the ones who can afford good preparation in basic ed. So this is why the first point here, 40% uh, of senior high school graduates in the Philippines do not enter college. 
Um, and there is, unfortunately, a related issue to access, which will give us some insight into the uh, demand side of this market failure. Uh, poor preparation uh, is uh, basically referring to the declining quality of basic ed uh, in the Philippines, uh, which groups like uh, PBED, Philippine Business for Education, uh, have been uh, raising as an advocacy point, uh, when, especially when they're talking about the uh, education crisis in the country. And I would recommend strongly that, that you read that, uh, that research from PBED. Um, in response to this, FINMA Education has open admissions, no tests, uh, because if we do that, we'll, if we have tests, we'll end up like QP and you know, that, that will be against our mission. Uh, but also because of that, uh, every few years, uh, we conduct our own diagnostic exam, not to screen students out, but just to kind of test for college readiness. And, and the sad fact here is that only 2% of our college freshmen are actually ready for college. And that's on a good year. Uh, on a bad year, it's going to be 1%. And, and, and we're talking about scale. If you're going to look at the actual quality, the average freshman in, in our FIM education colleges has the reading, math, and science proficiencies of a grade six student. Sadly, that is the result of the practice in many um, public, uh, public schools, grade schools and high schools, where students are promoted despite uh, weak performance. Second problem, completion. Entering college is only part of the problem. Staying in college is something that most middle-income households take for granted, but uh, it is a major challenge for low-income students. In, in FINMA Ed colleges, 15% of students drop out every semester. If you look at the subset of freshmen, which tends to be the more vulnerable population, 20% drop out every semester. Um, and it's, as we discussed earlier, one major unexpected uh, expense uh, or cash flow disruption. Uh, and the parents of our students need to ask that horrible question, who among their children get to continue and who need to stop? And uh, the other lesson uh, here uh, is that what appears primarily as a financial issue is actually a very complex set of problems. What starts out as financial, eventually gets compounded by academic issues. And these academic issues and financial issues, these disappointments eventually turn into moments of self-doubt. And all of those issues, academic, financial, personal, uh, are these it's a confluence of these issues that really drive dropouts uh, among low-income students. There's a study in the University of Texas that says, the expectations of parents uh, regarding the continued, expect, uh, uh, continued education of their students, of their children, is a strong predictor of, of dropouts among uh, low income students. Low income students. Um, about 50% of our students are first generation college students. So their parents don't have the same expectations about their sense of belongingness uh, to college. And so this, again, combination of unpredictable cash flows poor academic quality of preparation and low expectations. These are some of the drivers of uh, dropping out. When we look at it longitudinally, if we have 100 freshmen right now, only about 35 of these students, these freshmen will graduate after five years uh, in our system. Um, it's actually an improvement from 25% a few years back. We've been really trying to folk, uh, do a lot of uh, strong effort in retention, but it's still a major challenge for us. Uh, but interestingly, we're not alone, um, not just in the Philippines, but even in other countries. When we visited the United States two years ago uh, and spoke with uh, community colleges uh, in Illinois and in Florida, they told us that only 20% of their students in community colleges complete the program in three years. So it, community colleges in the US, as you know, a two-year program, usually uh, associate's degree, usually targeted at low-income students uh, in the United States, mostly African-American, Hispanic communities in inner city neighborhoods. With all of the resources available to them, all the grants and all the loans from the federal government, 
still only 20% uh, complete uh, a two-year program in three years. Unfortunately, for low-income students, life gets in the way, and it doesn't matter where you live. Pro problem number three, employment. Uh, there's too much focus on diplomas instead of the skills needed by employers. The world of work is changing. More and more businesses operate through discrete projects and are less likely to provide employee tenure. Uh, hence, they are looking at uh, more specific skills rather than degrees. Unfortunately, educational institutions continue to offer four-year programs where formal learning pretty much ends after graduation. What we need is a more responsive, nimble, and continuing learning system, and we're not there yet. Uh, and when we are talking about nimble, um, I just wanted to share uh, something that uh, a colleague from the IT industry uh, shared with us before. Um, the past few years, especially after uh, 2018, there's a steady decline in enrollment among IT uh, majors in the Philippines, uh, information technology. A large part of it is because of the changes in K-12. Uh, if you remember, IT was, was, classified, was classified as one of the tech uh, programs um, where, um, uh, tech ed programs, I mean, uh, where the emphasis was if you do well in senior high school, you can start working. You don't need to go to college. So that was a big uh, factor in the decline in enrollment. However, uh, this colleague of ours said, you know, part of it might be because the market is already sensing just how difficult it is to be to succeed in IT, even if uh, you have a college diploma. He was saying, you know, this idea of disruptive technology for most of the people in this room, that's usually a good thing, right? It, it leads to innovation. Uh, but as we know, you know, the, the invisible hand casts a bad shadow, and that's poverty. And in this case, the unintended consequence of disruptive technology is that you have IT students who study whatever software they need to learn in first year, but by the time they graduate, or even before they graduate, those software become obsolete. And so on one hand, that's good it's a, uh, in, in terms of innovation. On the other hand, it really makes the uh, career prospects of students very unpredictable and very unstable. And so given that, it, we, we need to be able to have an, uh, uh, an educational system that really focuses more on uh, employment. Um, so now that you're thoroughly depressed, I, I would like to kind of shift to the next slide, please, uh, and share some activities that we are doing to address these issues. These are not RCT proven interventions, uh, but they are the beginnings of an inquiry uh, into a, a coherent set of solutions that may prove to be scalable, that may prove to be sustainable. So access, preparation. Uh, what we do in FIM education is we are obsessed about cutting costs because uh, when we are able to cut costs, we transfer the savings to the students in terms of reduced fees. When reduced fees, we reduce barriers to entry. So we have this phrase uh, in FINMA Ed called no frills, bare bones, brass knuckles approach to education. Practically, that means we cut out every expense that are not directly productive uh, in terms of the uh, academic outcomes of our students. No basketball teams for us. We have to figure out some other way of marketing. No beauty pageants. Oddly enough, Philippine schools and students like these things. Um, we don't offer uh, a lot of liberal arts programs. Uh, I was a philosophy major. We don't have philosophy degrees uh, in, in, in film education. Our, our programs tend to uh, focus on the kinds of uh, uh, courses that offer jobs that are readily available outside metro centers. That would be education for teachers, uh, criminology for uh, police officers, and those that give a high chance of employment outside the country, nursing, IT, engineering. We're also a teaching university. We don't necessarily, we don't focus on research. We consume a lot of research, but we don't produce it our, ourselves. And we have our, our faculty need to be focused on teaching 
not on publication. And we create incentives for good teaching. Um, you can get a significantly high salary even if you don't have a PhD, as long as you are a very good teacher. Um, and the other aspect uh, to the solution for, for access is, as we said, poor preparation. We need to deal with remediation um, right from the start, uh, from day one. Um, we can't do what Ateneo does in terms of, oh, okay, you're not good enough for math 11, you have to do math 10 for the first sem. Our students can't afford an extra uh, semester of just remediation classes. Uh, so we need to be able to find a way to teach the CHED prescribed curriculum from day one and at the same time make up for the past six years of uh, deficient preparation. Um, and one way for us uh, to try to get that kickstart for our students in terms of learning um, when they have this backlog in terms of poor preparation is what we learned from a, uh, a, 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 a husband and wife team. Unfortunately, the wife passed away recently. She, she was a Magsaysay, husband and wife or Magsaysay awardees, uh, the Bernidos uh, from Bohol, which they call active learning. The essence of that is basically we learn best when we grapple with problems rather than when we are passively listening to a lecture. In retrospect, that's very intuitive. In retrospect, it, we know it applies to all of us. But if that is not something that is uh, deliberately pursued by a lot of uh, educational institutions because we're very teacher-centric, we're very lecture-focused. The teacher is the fountain of all knowledge and wisdom. Uh, but in an active learning setup, the role of the teacher changes. Uh, they are now more a facilitator of learning. Uh, and the investment really is made in creating problem sets, structured exercises, both individual and group, where people, the students are grappling with these problems. And then the teachers there to kind of coach as they're grappling with these issues and say, okay, why don't you focus on this? We feel that that is the best way to get our students in the right uh, learning mode uh, over time. And it has the added benefit of reducing lecture time, which then allows us to have parallel classes, which then allows us to have students facilitating some of these uh, problem sets and exercises. And that allows us a great efficiency gain of increasing significantly student to teacher ratio even uh, while maintaining good quality, right? It, it's somewhat counterintuitive. In education, the sign of quality is fewer, teach, uh, fewer students per teachers, but that's also why it's very expensive. So if we want to have some innovation here, the point is to have some kind of experiment with improving efficiency while maintaining quality. Completion. We do a lot of retention efforts um, at the start, even before the semester begins. We already have a list of students that we think are at risk of dropping out. And so we reach out to these students. Uh, our faculty spend an inordinate amount of time reaching out to students outside of class. Um, after every semester, when a student is not able to get their permit, uh, we call the students. If we can't reach the students, we call their parents. If we can't reach their parents, we visit their homes three times a semester. These are things that Ateneo LaSalle faculty don't have to worry about. But this is something that we need to deal with because dropping out is a big issue. Uh, we offer uh, financial supports uh, to our students uh, in terms of loans when cash flows are disrupted. We have a lot of students whose aunts are supporting them. And sometimes the, um, the remittance is late. And so we can provide a, non -inter, a zero interest loan, uh, they just issue a promissory note. And when the money comes in, they can make the payment. So it's not so much the just large amounts. It's really just paying attention to cash flow. We are also experimenting with insurance, uh, not for the students, but for the people who are supporting their education, for the benefactors. Uh, so if the benefactor dies, gets sick, or loses their job, uh, there will be some benefit given to the students. Uh, and again, because of the challenges of the um, 
uh, some of the psychological and personal challenges uh, our students face, particularly during this pandemic. Uh, we brought in uh, our own, in addition to our own guidance counselors, a professional team of community counselors uh, who can help the students uh, achieve some level of uh, stability, equanimity, just ad address their anxieties. Uh, and so we'll help them to kind of lengthen the time horizon and really then make a decision to complete the work. Uh, I forgot one point about the scholarships for uh, the access. Uh, we do have a discount program where 50% of our students are able to uh, get a 50% discount uh, on top of the reduced fees that we're offering. And again, we're able to do this because we are reducing costs significantly. We focus on optimizing faculty load. We uh, invest in uh, solar energy, uh, LEDs, inverter air conditioning, so that we can reduce utilities. Utilities and staff are the two large uh, line items in our uh, p and um, And we need to be able to uh, lower our break-even point because if we lower our break-even point, it gives us much more flexibility to provide access to low-income students. Lastly, in terms of employment, uh, we have uh, a program. Uh, our career services program is really focused not just on matching the student to a particular job, but also engaging employers uh, and talking with them so that we can rework the curriculum. We need to ask the employees, what competencies do you need now? What competencies do you need five years from now? And we need to develop our curriculum to address that and at the same time, make it CHED compliant. Uh, but you know, most other schools don't do that uh, because, you know, the, the thinking is, oh, you're not an A grad, you're a LaSalle grad. It kind of doesn't matter what skills you have because you have the social network and you have this prestige. Unfortunately, that's not true of majority of our students. And so we need to pay attention to that. Uh, we also need to look at uh, creating industry councils uh, that will really help us zero in on the specific changes in industries that we need to pay attention to. Uh, and lastly, we have uh, this idea of micro-credentials. Um, it's still work in progress, uh, but the idea here is that uh, instead of fixating on the diploma, you want to be able to um, create a, 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 a resume uh, of a portfolio of skills that the students will be able to connect with readily available jobs, even if they don't finish their classes or their education. So what we really are trying to do here is to flip the system, right? Not make it focused on the degree, but to make it more focused on the needs of the students for employment. Be able to then serve the human capital needs of employers and connect that to the needs of the student. Uh, and this allows us also to then redefine what lifelong learning or continuous education means, right? It, it, again, the diploma kind of sense that, okay, once you're graduated, it's done. But what we're seeing in the world of work is that, okay, you might have uh, employment now, but at some point your skills will plateau and you need to acquire more skills. And you know, not everybody can afford graduate school. Um, but there must be a way for us to come up with short, inexpensive, skills-focused, employment-connected opportunities for learning. And that allows us to redefine um, continuous education. Uh, last slide, please. Um, we are a for-profit uh, business. We are not a nonprofit charitable institution. Uh, but we are very mission focused uh, and uh, we need to be able to serve our customer low income households in the most in the best possible way. We need to be able to constantly improve the way we provide good quality and affordable education. And that is what makes uh, the business successful and what we see is a real market opportunity. Um, we're so far lucky that we have had some kind of first mover advantage, but we're starting to see the other players in the educational sector in the Philippines notice the opportunity and, and move down market. Uh, but this is what we need. Uh, we need to have 
uh, an ability to channel the power of business as a force for good. Uh, clearly, there are limitations to that. There are weaknesses to towards that. But there really is an opportunity here that we think uh, we should be able to harness so that we can add, again, another layer to the definition of complementarity between private sector and the public uh, sector. And so to end, uh, I just wanted to kind of share this. Um, uh, I, I used to work for the Grameen Foundation and uh, Professor Yunus was uh, an emeritus board chair uh, of Grameen. Um, and that's what he's saying. This is not charity, this is business, but with a social objective. Um, it's doable. I think what's important here is that to remember is that Grameen Bank um, was the first mover, but it has now been uh, kind of left behind in many ways by some of these large microfinance institutions in, in India uh, and in Latin America, much larger than Grameen, even much more diverse. Uh, but that's not the point. It, the success of Grameen Foundation is not found in its continued leadership in terms of size. Its success lies in the fact that it created a paradigm shift and proved to the world that serving low-income borrowers, in their case, proved to be both a good social opportunity and a good business. I think that is a similar opportunity uh, that we see here. And paradoxically, uh, it, the success might be measured uh, for the Green Foundation as the same thing with FINMA Education in the way we increase competition for us. Because now people see that serving the poor is a viable business model. So I'll pause here. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, we'll answer questions later. Thanks, Mr. Tan. That was really interesting. Um, you know, first, you know, you were talking about you know how how critical education is to to addressing inequality, uh, but of course, the compounding challenges that that Filipino students from low-income families face, um, and of course, the, the many innovative approaches that Finn was using uh, to prepare students for for the evolving workforce demands, and and it's really interesting for me, and uh, and I thank you so much for for sharing this morning. Um, I'll now, so thank you, uh, Mr. Hagitan. Uh, next up, we have uh, Mr. Francisco Del Rosario. Mr. Francisco Del Rosario uh, Jr. Is, a chairman, is the chairman of the, uh, of the Board of Trustees of the Institute for Solidarity in Asia, or ISA. He has served as the president and CEO of the Development Bank of the Philippines, president of the Cultural Center of the Philippines, and undersecretary in the Department of National Defense. Mr. Del Rosario has also, uh, was also the former president of the Management Association of the Philippines and is currently an independent director of Metro Bank. He has over 40 years of experience in private and public sector. Uh, Mr. Francisco, it will be talking about transforming the public sector for inclusive growth. Uh, good morning, sir. The floor is yours, Paul. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Okay, uh, good morning. With the election fever running full blast, we are reminded today by the different candidates of several issues facing our country. A lot of talk, a lot of promises. Today, we realize that we have to act. And this is exactly what I will discuss in building our dream Philippines and in reducing inequality for inclusive growth through empowering the public sector. Let me start by giving all of you some relevant background data. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, the population in the Philippines as of March 24, 2022 is now at 112,161,938 and still growing. Next slide, please. 23.7% of Filipinos were poor in the first semester of 2021, which translates to 26.14 million poor Filipinos. 
Next slide, please. 18% of Filipino families were poor in the first semester of 2021, which translates to 4.74 million poor Filipino families. The pandemic for the past two years has actually ag aggravated the situation of the poor. Now, let's try to understand the different causes of poverty. One, of course, is our self-serving leadership, wherein we have leaders uh, who are only interested in their own uh, vested interests and uh, not um, trying to help the general majority. Number two, poor public service. Uh, this is the kind of service which does not satisfy the basic needs of people. Number three, of course, corruption and greed, which has been with us for time immemorial, draining our financial and natural resources and enriching only a few. So the questions that we need to answer at this point are, one, how do we help the poor? How do we transform our country? To give an indication on what the life of all Filipinos in 2040 should be, matatag, maginhawa, at panatag na buhay, by 2040, Filipinos should be able to enjoy a strongly rooted, comfortable, and secure life. And this is stated in NEDA's ambition natin 2040. In 2040, we should all enjoy a stable and comfortable lifestyle, secure in the knowledge that we have enough for our daily needs and unexpected expenses, that we can plan and prepare for our own and our children's future. Our family lives together in a place of our own and we have the freedom to go where we desire, protected and enabled by a clean, efficient, and fair government. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so to achieve this, I will challenge everyone today with the presentation of a dream. Our dream Philippines, wherein we have a government where every institution delivers and every citizen participates and prospers. So how do we achieve change to attain our dream Philippines? I believe good governance is the key to transformation. Next slide, please. How important actually is good governance? Good governance delivers in improving basic services in government by making sure that it's timely and prompt and, it, and, and it's effective and efficient. Good governance also delivers in addressing poverty among LGUs by providing employment and prosperity, by ensuring that we will have a low crime rate and high security, and making it desirable for our OFWs to return home. But why has the Philippines failed? Let me quote from a widely, from a widely read book, Why Nations Fail to Understand the Reason. And I quote, nations fail because they fail to set up strong, inclusive, and sustainable institutions. Next slide, please. And so a very important question for all of us is to attain change is actually how can we empower the government to become strong, inclusive, and sustainable institutions? In ISA, the Institute for Solidarity in Asia, <coughs> where I am the present chairman, through our interventions with national government agencies and local government units, we are able to do this 
to our performance governance system, which helps government translate its mission and vision into a sound strategy by first creating a vision, formulating a strategy, making the action plan, and finally uh, monitoring and making sure that the desired results are obtained. Let me show you as an example, uh, the strategy map made by DSWD uh, up to 2028. Their vision is the Department of Social Welfare and Development envisions all Filipinos free from hunger, have equal access to opportunities enabled by a fair, just, and peaceful society. And then the impact, of course, is to improve social protection, contributing to poverty reduction. And then they focus on the increased capacity of LGUs and the improvement of the well being of beneficiaries and four piece households. <clears throat> and then looking at the core, uh, they mainstream the social protection and the comprehensive development plan of the LGUs. They have a policy reform. They have a social case management, and then they look at the regulatory framework. And then they also have the support uh, mechanism uh, found in human and organizational capital, information capital, monitoring and evaluation, and the finance and logistics. The mission, as they uh, formulated it, is to lead in the formulation, implementation, and coordination of social welfare and developmental policies and programs for and with the poor, vulnerable and disadvantaged. Now, let me just uh, focus with the next uh, strategy map. Can we uh, have the next slide? Okay, this is a strategy map for the office of the vice president, which were in uh, ISA assisted in formulating. Uh, as you know, our vice president, Lenny Robredo, is one of our leading presidential candidates. So looking at her strategy map, the impact that she desires is that the public good will be enhanced, the quality of life will be improved. And then her strategic focus is to showcase the vice president's empathy and principled leadership. The core process, she wants to build coalitions around shared advocacies, strengthen communities as models of convergence and transformation, increase awareness of the vice president's brand of leadership and deliver uh, responsive services to the public. Now, what is the support process of the office of the vice president? To address comp competency gaps to various modalities, to use evidence-based processes to improve outcomes, to deepen connections through quality engagement, to institutionalize due diligence in critical operating units, and finally, to ensure responsible and strategic use of taxpayers' money. The mission of the OBP is to serve as a convergence platform for engaging citizens in nation building promoting the principles for democracy and empowering communities in the fight against poverty. Her core values, of course, are servant leadership, shared leadership, and strategic leadership. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Focusing on the performance governance system, let me discuss this more in detail. There are, the, we have a four stage pathway under the PGS. The first one is of course the initiation stage. The first stage of the PGS focuses actually on the formulation of the basic governance documents that are anchored on strategic positioning. Second, the hallmark of PGS initiation is the design of the basic governance documents composed of the strategic deliverables for roadmaps, a strategy map, as I showed you earlier, and an enterprise scorecard 
that are all anchored on a compelling strategic positioning. The second stage of this pathway is compliance. The compliance stage looks at how the basic governance documents are executed through cascading to lower level units and establishing key governance mechanisms for managing the strategy. And the hallmark of the compliance stage is actually the presence of emerging breakthrough results produced from a disciplined strategy execution process that centers on conversation, feedback, and recognition at the level of the enterprise and units. Managing all of these activities, the organization must establish an office for strategy management that will oversee the implementation of the strategy and continuously monitor its progress. Additionally, the organization must also create a multi-sectoral governance council that can take part in the realization of the strategy. The third stage of the pathway is proficiency. The hallmark of PGS proficiency is the presence of emerging breakthrough results to the support of a fully functional office for strategy management. The fourth pathway is institutionalization. Organizations in the last stage of the PGS are expected to have at least one breakthrough result as reflected, reflected by its strategic position. In ISA, we also have uh, customized interventions for the LGUs and NGAs. The first one is strategy formulation. In strategy formulation, the organization works with ISA to integrate existing plans into a cohesive long-term strategy that seeks to level up the delivery of the organization's mandate. This session is dedicated to crafting the strategy map and governance scorecard, the guiding frameworks which define and detail the overall strategic direction of the organization. The second intervention that we have is cleaning up, the cleanup. The cleanup session is dedicated to polishing the initial strategy map, enterprise scorecard, and strategic deliverables to ensure the readiness of the strategy for execution. The third, uh, the third that ISA is offering uh, intervention uh, is that we seek to capacitate the organization's department heads through a series of cascading sessions to ensure their units progression towards the fulfillment of their del deliverables and targets outlined in their scorecards. And finally, uh, well, we also have the OSM capacity building and MSGC management. In this session, ISA trains the members of the organization's office for strategy management and orients them on how to properly execute, monitor, and sustain their organization's strategy, as well as manage their multi-sectoral governance councils. And then we have the pre uh, revalidas <clears throat> the pre-revalida -re actually prepares an organization for their upcoming public revalida, where they will present the progress and milestones of their strategy. And then we have the public revalida. The public revalida is a platform where organizations present their stories of transformation and progression in the PGS pathway before a specially convened panel of good governance and field experts. And then we have the organizational assessment. The organizational assess assessment actually evaluates the maturity of the organization's strategic red readiness and governance mechanisms based on the parameters of the PGS. We also have the SPOT audit. The SPOT audit checks the progress of the organization's strategy vis-a-vis the strategic contributions of selected key departments and units. 
It aims to validate the presence and maturity of the essential elements of the PGS, critical to the execution and sustainability of the organization strategy at a particular PGS stage. And then we have the strategic readiness test for proficiency and institutionalization. The strategic readiness test evaluates the maturity of the organization's strategic readiness and governance mechanisms using the parameters of the PGS. Finally, we have the third party audit for proficiency and institutionalization. The governance mechanisms assessment is conducted by a third party auditor to evaluate the maturity of the identified governance elements and the integrity of the breakthrough results. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, today, ISA has 169 partner organizations as of March 2022. We have 48 local government units, 53 national government agencies, 51 uh, Department of Health retained hospitals, eight sectoral institutions, and nine academic institutions. We have other programs as well in ISA. Can we have the next slide, please? Uh, one is we have the Governance Bootcamp. Uh, the Governance Bootcamp is a governance best practice and leadership training program designed to equip individuals in the public sector with the skills and knowledge needed to successfully implement the PGS framework in their organizations. We also have the Skills Lab which is a capacity development program designed to empower organizations by enhancing diverse skills unique to any organization's needs to achieve long-term sustainability and success. And finally, we have an empowered development for governance, an intensive four-week certificate program that aims to provide public sector leaders and governance practitioners with a strong foundation for governance advocacy. Can we have the next slide, please? Uh, a recent PGS recipient of ISA, where concrete positive results have been achieved, is the Bureau of Customs. We are proud to say that because of the modernization of business processes in the Bureau of Customs, the BOC has become more efficient and uh, less corrupt. Uh, you know, we have put or place corruption to a minimum and uh, we're happy about this. Can we have the next slide, please? Another uh, trans successful transformation that we have achieved is the uh, development of the province of La Union as a tourism hub in Northern Luzon. And so to end, let me bring you back to Ambition Natin 2040, which states that the life of all Filipinos in 2040 should be matatag, maginhawa, at panatag na buhay. And this dream can actually be achieved by empowering public institutions for our dream Philippines. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Delgasario. Thanks for sharing all of the, the accomplishments and, and activities and initiatives of ISA. It really is very impressive. Um, and, and of course, thank, thank you for highlighting you know, the, the importance, the important role that, that public institutions play in, in achieving our long-term uh, goal of uh, you know, getting rid of inequality. Uh, I think a key part of, of your message earlier, which I recall, was the ability to, which you guys are, are doing very and very active in, is bridging the mission and the vision to, to actual strategy that can be implemented so that uh, results can actually be felt on the ground. So thank you so much, sir. Um, thank you for your talk. Uh, actually, sir, you're the, you are the, the last but not least speaker for, for today's program. And that means that uh, we are now at the point of our program uh, where uh, we open up the floor 
to to questions from from the different participants from the participants. Um, so, like I said earlier, and I'll, I'll repeat myself. Uh, if you guys, our participants, have any questions, uh, please. If you're on Zoom, you can use the Q and A function. If you're on Facebook, feel free to to comment or send us a direct message. Uh, and we have a team, like I said, that's collecting all of these questions, and we'll try to get through them in the most organized way possible. Um, I already see that some questions are coming in, so let me let me dive right into it. Uh, so we have. Oh, well, Dean Ron answered the one that I wanted to start with, but uh, he answered it uh, through the Q&A function. Um, but Dean Ron, maybe you'd like to, to elaborate for, for our, the purposes of our audience hearing your answer. So there was a question actually um, that said, I agree with Dean, uh, Dr. Ron Mendoza, uh, of the need for strong political parties for consistent policy agendas and political financial reforms. Can Dr. Ron give, in, give our audience a snapshot summary of what each involves and how to accomplish when the incumbent political class is uncooperative? Dean Ron. Thank you, Paco. Uh, unfortunately, I'm just an economist. So if you need uh, the details of each package of reforms, uh, I can only give uh, broad brushstroke descriptions, which is what I noted there. Dynasty regulation essentially requires a definition uh, of what a dynasty is. And uh, in, in my analogy, it's like a, it's like a stoplight. You, you, you can allow more leaders to pass through uh, if you are able to regulate the number of leaders for any particular set of families uh, in, in particular uh, jurisdictions. Uh, so it's not necessarily going to prevent uh, any particular leader from running from office. It's just that you give them an orderly way of doing it. So hindi tama yung sinabi ng isang dynasty na uh, unconstitutional daw to at saka against their rights to serve the people. No. The idea is to get more Filipino leaders, particularly younger leaders, a chance to serve, not just from that particular fat dynasty's family. So they cannot turn it on its head. If we define this properly, more young leaders will get a chance to lead us, and that's what we're looking forward to. Political party reforms are, you know, uh, anti-butterfly, so yung, yung mga palipat-lipat ng partido, discipline in terms of political party platforms, running of primaries, financing of parties, all of these things. Uh, there are better uh, experts to actually define them, um, you know, each of these uh, reform elements. But uh, as an economist, I understand how it contributes to better governance and stronger uh, political institutions. Those are the things we need to unpack because we tend to focus on big economic reform agendas, but in the execution, that is where we fail. No? So I very much like the description of the other presenters where you, we get the big picture. We see the reform we need to implement, but when it hits the ground, bakit ganun ang nangyari? Parang hindi yan yung pinag-usapan natin. Ha? So yung OTOP, for instance, I sort of a fan of this particular uh, reform. In principle, it can be a very impactful reform in different provinces, but without the deep thinking of what you're actually strengthening and capacitating and anchoring in your area, um, it's not going to produce as much benefit for your uh, jurisdiction, diba? Right? So I very much like the presentation of Prof. CP earlier, and, and I hope this, this is one of the basic reforms we can do a much better job on, even if some of the governance is still wanting. Uh, I think the, the main question of John Forbes actually in that point was, how do you get them to accept this particular seeding of power? Because they're already concentrating political power with each election. Eh. So how, why are they going to you know, suddenly accept a, a fat dynasty from the North with 15 family members? lang only three of them can stay in office. So wala na trabaho yung labing dalawa. Eh. Ang laki na nung ginastos nila dun sa mga kamag-anak nila. Um, and and uh, quite candidly, I, I think, and we're, we're at that stage where I think we should all be candid at this point. Uh, we, we need a grand bargain for our political elites. And our economic and business elites need to realize that even their interests are not going to be sustained by this present system. It, it's not feasible. We will hit the political noise and governance failures over and over again. So even if 
we briefly enjoyed, you know, fastest growing Asian economy for a few quarters. Pangitang pangita na hindi natin sa masusustain through crises, through pandemics, through populist waves. Uh, and our business community can do their part. Obviously, lots of great stuff being done by Happy's group, by uh, Mr. Francisco Del Rosario's group. We, these are all on the margins. <laughs> if the main governance problem is not addressed, we can continue to do our work and continue to host these events. But we're really just nibbling on the sides. The bigger problem is the governance and the leadership. And we can never overcome that particular deficit until we fix it. Thanks, Dean Ron. Uh, the question was for Dean Ron, but if anybody else wanted to weigh in, uh, now is the time to, to jump in. If not, if not, that's also okay. <laughs> um, uh, we actually, there, I wanted to revisit a question that was asked to, to Dr. CP. Uh, so it said, Dr. David, um, don't you think the rampant land classification of agricultural lands to non-agricultural uses should also be included in the problems besieging, uh, besieging the agricultural sector, which also poses a great threat to food security? And then, Doc CP, there was a second part to it. Um, and and uh, the question the participant was asking, uh, maybe we should recommend support legislation, which includes rampant land conversion of prime agricultural lands, including irrigated and irrigatable la land holdings as a prohibited act, and that offenders should be rightfully penalized. Do you have any additional thoughts on, on this question slash comment? This was a question from uh, Rita Makabulos. No? Thanks Sorry, for the right. question. Alamo, we forgot to put uh, an asterisk when we did uh, the agrarian reform law. And that is, not to me, I think if you are providing lands to farmers, then there has to be that asterisk that that land cannot be converted for any other use other than agriculture. Now, it might be limiting, but that was the sole purpose of providing land to our farmers so that they actually farm their own lands. No? But if uh, in the end they will just sell that, then it defeats the purpose of agrarian reform. The second thing is that uh, the, the grant shouldn't have been a one-time grant, meaning that if you fail to farm a land that has been provided to you, then it has to be given back to government because the main purpose of that land, again, is agriculture. So these caveats to that law, in my mind, should have been there. Um, I definitely agree that it was a, an equity solution, no? but efficiency-wise, our agriculture sector actually even became more inefficient because of uh, land reform. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Doc CP. Uh, so I'm looking through our questions here. If we have any more. Well, there, okay, so there's a question here. Uh, good morning. It's addressed to Dr. Mendoza, actually. You mentioned that the Philippines signed agreements to lower tariffs and protections but our ability to boost our own supply is weak. Can you explain further what this means, supply is weak, or give an example? Dean Thank you. Thank you, Paco. I mean, th yeah. this has been uh, one of my advocacies uh, recently that um, we economists actually need to focus more on governance and institutions as well, because we cannot just keep on espousing a more open economy without also espousing the fixing of our governance to strengthen our supply side. Because otherwise, we will keep on opening our economy and exposing all of our sectors to being beaten up in terms of competition. There is, you know, uh, I, I guess we are taught there is a magic hand that, uh, or invisible hand that drives competitiveness investment so that eventually the strong will survive and the weak will just phase into other sectors. But in reality, in terms of industrial policy, government and public uh, policy can play a key role in capacitating certain key sectors 
that are strategically important for us and can help us uh, continue our industrialization process. Now, this is this is well known and evidence based in the past, uh, I guess, two decades of, of research. So, and, and this is what uh, Prof. CP was beginning to describe in his presentation. You know, not just producing these simple products, but basically thinking big about some of these, uh, you know, strategies for the provinces. So this is where we fail. We we uh, we um, are are able to consider success in terms of opening up some opening up. I'm not saying it's done and it's uh, you know that there is no reform agenda left for opening up. There is no, but the but the challenge is a governance one because the supply side requires effective collective action, whole of nation activities. That's where we fail because governance is weak and institutions are weak. And that's where we need to address uh, the reform agenda too. Thanks, Dean Ron. Yeah, you, you touched on, on something. You, you said, uh, you mentioned, you know, the whole of society approach and, and it actually sets the, the stage for this next question um, that I'm about to ask. Uh, and the question here is, uh, should the public and private sectors take on equal responsibility in promoting inclusive growth? I think this is a question that can be answered by, by all of our speakers, but I think uh, we could also give uh, uh, Mr. Hapitan uh, an opportunity to answer this first, because I know that the education sector is one where is one of those sectors where uh, the private sector uh, does plays a key role along with the private along with the public sector in delivery, delivery and quality education. So, uh, Mr. Tan, do you think that the public and private sector uh, should take on equal responsibility in promoting inclusive growth? Um, yes, short answer. Yep. Um, but I think um, what's important here is to really look at the set of incentives and pressures uh, that will encourage the private sector uh, to take on more social problems. You know, it, there, there, there are in the past few decades, great developments we've seen in education, in finance as well, uh, with the rise of the microfinance institutions, where, you know, even with the existing set of policies and incentives, you have these social entrepreneurs who are going to pursue uh, opportunities to, to, to solve social problems using business or the discipline of business. But as Dr. Mendoza said, that's marginal. You know, um, for every FINMA education, you have about a lot more universities who don't really operate that way. For every Grameen Bank, there are a lot more city banks and, and uh, you know, other standard chartered who, you know, uh, they, they donate, but they, that's not their core activity. Um, and so we need to have that shift from a more command and control uh, policy regime to one that really tries to see what are the supply and uh, demand side elements or factors that will help us provide the public goods and the social goods that we want. You know, our problem right now, partly, and I'm saying this as a lawyer, is that most of the chiefs of staff of legislators are lawyers. We need to put more economists on, on that role because if, if, if you have lawyers doing policy, their basic question is, will this policy be supported or validated or invalidated by the Supreme Court? But nobody's talking about, okay, what kinds of uh, factors do we need to put in place so that uh, there we will encourage the production of these social goods. So, so yes, uh, definitely need to have but uh, private sector involved. But unless we really understand what drives, uh, and we have to find that balance between selfishness or or, or self -cent or, 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 or self centeredness, and at the same time, long term, right, uh, rational decision making, so that it not just benefits individual businesses but the broader community. Uh, if we do have that, then people like us will be a bit more, you know, commonplace, and and it's not just something that people are doing because they're trying to be altruistic. Uh, but this is something that is uh, good for everybody. Definitely, definitely. Um, unless you know, 
Doc CP or Dr. Ron, you guys want to weigh in? You know, I, I, I agree. You know, I mean, you were mentioning earlier, uh, Mr. Tan, that it has to be uh, financially viable as well for businesses because right? that's why you're here, right? It's, it's about, um, it's about, you know, sustaining the business, but of course, having this, um, this concern as well for, for, for your stakeholders. Um, and I think this really brings up another issue, uh, the changing demands of stakeholders as well. I think uh, um, as, you know, we see, we're already seeing this, that uh, people now are demanding of companies, of employers, that uh, they're not only about, um, concerned about the bottom line, but also about issues like the environment or or equality and things like that. Um, so yeah, uh, and if, uh, so thanks so much, Mr. Tan. I don't know if uh, Mr. Dadrasari is still here. Uh, Are you, yeah. yeah, sir. Yes, yes, I'm yeah, here. Okay, well, I actually, uh, speaking about employers, I, there's one question here that I thought I'd address to you. Um, and it says here, based on your experiences, what does it mean to be a responsible ethical employer? Do you believe? Oh, do you believe that the wages in the Philippines allow employees to meet their basic needs? Uh, do you have any insight on that, as uh, from the business sector, wearing your business sector hat? Yeah, uh, in the Management Association of the Philippines, yeah, we have a program called the Shared Prosperity Program, where uh, we we have a covenant and. Uh, Many companies have signed that covenant with regards to the shared prosperity program. But basically, what, what that means is that, you know, when a company makes money, I mean, it doesn't just go to the shareholders or to the key executives, but that income should also flow to the other uh, members of the stakeholders group, especially the employees, the community in general, uh, even the suppliers and all that, no? In effect, what you're trying to do is that you're sharing the, as the name connotes, and you're sharing the prosperity or success of that particular company. So we want to make sure that companies are all aware of that, that they have to make sure primarily uh, that their employees will be provided for uh, as far as needs are concerned by giving them just wages, bonuses, uh, loans, and all that. So that's the shared prosperity program. But you also mentioned something about ESG. ESG, as you know, uh, nowadays uh, is very much in focus, even among the foreign uh, institutions. So we're also focusing on that in MAP, uh, Environment, Social Justice, and Governance because these are all important areas in making sure that the business sector and the country will progress in the correct direction, which is uh, basically inclusive growth. Thanks, Mr. Delisario. Uh, so yeah, I think what we've heard so far really is, is how one takeaway that I would like to, to highlight is how all these sectors, private sector, public sector, um, and even as a citizen, uh, education sector, agriculture, how all of these things um, contribute to, to you know, bridging this, this uh, gap we have in terms of inequality. Um, a lot of points are raised. I think the most uh, interesting for me, of course, was uh, the political reforms and the governance reforms that are needed. Uh, now, I am about actually to, to wrap up uh, the, the Q&A. But before I do, I wanted to throw out this one last question uh, that's been asked a couple of times, one uh, through the Q&A function uh, and another through, through Facebook. And it's, uh, if there was a single, what, is, what should be the single most important reform priority to address inequality in the country? Uh, and, and I wanted to use this question to give all of our speakers the opportunity to, to answer the question, but also throw out any like key messages that they wanted uh, the audience to hear before we, we wrapped up the, the Q&A. Uh, perhaps I could uh, for, to bring some sense of order uh, to the flow of the, the question. I'll ask first Dean Ron uh, if he has 
any insight on this question or any you know last words for our participants? Yes, I, I think an economist probably asked that question because uh, it, <laughs> he's challenging us or she's challenging us to have a priority, right? Uh, and the and the challenge is actually in building governance in institutions. Once you fix one problem, the next problem emerges that you need to tackle. So uh, even with that caveat, uh, I would say that dynasty regulation would need to be, to be passed in order to restore legitimacy to our uh, local governance and also national governance and also to restore stronger competition in our electoral process. But having said that, there are many other important reforms that need to be packaged with dynasty regulation. And in fact, uh, once you regulate dynasties, they will probably behave in another set of ways that um, you know, encourage their cronies to run for office and, and, and still try to build a cabal of corruption in some areas. So you'll need to just be, the reformists will just need to be one step ahead of all those behavioral changes to keep strengthening governance. Thank you. Thanks, Tiran. Uh, Dr. C.P., would you like to weigh in? Um, I guess my recommendation would be, well, it's born out of frustration of uh, seeing our country lagging behind our neighbors in the ASEAN, whom we were uh, well ahead of no, in just a couple of decades ago. Um, and, and therefore, no, not seeing any huge reform, I would rather opt for pockets of reforms, whether it be geographic or sectoral. Parang walang nag-work dun sa overnight uh, policy and then all of a sudden everything is in order. So I would rather see uh, well, uh, uh, an image comes to mind, for example, traffic discipline in Subic or in Clark. How come we can do that in such a small area, geographic area? And if we get that same concept and apply it to certain sectors or certain provinces or towns, then perhaps there, there'd be uh, progress even small steps, but definitely there is progress. Instead of waiting for that huge progress that overnight our country will be up there once again, next to uh, Malaysia and Thailand and Singapore in the region. No? So, mas conservative, I think it comes with age. So, <laughs> baka ganun yung nakikita kong strategy moving forward instead of these big, big leaps that uh, we are all hoping for. Thanks, Doc CP. Yeah, there, I think we have to realize there are no shortcuts, right, when it comes to these things. Uh, next up, uh, Mr. Hapitan, do you have any insight you'd like to share with us? Um, yeah, increased spending on education as a percentage of GDP, but I think more importantly, focus it on basic education for women. Girls, right? The more we've seen in, in, in most of, of other countries, the more you invest in well, women's education, uh, the more, uh, well, one very important thing is population uh, size decreases because they postpone childbirth. Uh, and then that allows us to create all sorts of beneficial um, uh, developments from there. Also focus on uh, technology, tech ed, uh, and really reduce this bias for uh, liberal arts. Uh, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. Uh, most of us here are the products of that, but uh, there is a significant imbalance uh, in, in what we're prioritizing uh, when it comes to education. So women and technical education. Thanks, sir. That's a uh, nice insight there. Now, uh, Mr. Del Rosario, are, are you, you have anything you'd like to Share. It's all right if uh, if you don't. You, you've shared a lot throughout the throughout the session, so I am very thankful to uh, Mr. Del Rosario and all of our speakers from uh, Dean Ron. Uh, yeah. Ah, yeah, and sir. Hi. <laughs> I was on mute. I'm sorry. Okay. So that's I, what, no problem. What I just want to share is that uh, governance is absolutely shared responsibility. You know, like the PPP, we should have uh, public sector, private sector participation as far as 
governance is concerned. In fact, this afternoon, uh, I'd like to share that I have a meeting with the Armed Forces Chief of Staff and some members of the military establishment. And I'm uh, happy to tell all of you that uh, AFP would like to move forward as far as uh, governance is concerned. So they're asking us how we can, how they can achieve this. They want to go for the highest award in governance. Actually, Dr. Ron is a member of the Multi-Sectoral Governance Council of the AFP. But uh, it's been difficult to arrange a meeting, uh, Dr. Ron, for all of us to attend. They always prefer a small group like this, af this afternoon. Uh, I wanted the MSGC to attend the meeting, but they said they prefer a small group. So it's just just Stanislaw, Rex Dillon, and myself who are attending. But I'm happy to say, as I said, uh, they would like to move on and they want to be a governance uh, expert. So, and also, of course, we would like to ensure in our discussions with them that they will remain independent and that they will do their uh, duty as far as ensuring that elections will be clean and peaceful. All right. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. Del Rosario. So yeah, definitely uh, a lot of insight there uh, from Mr. Del Rosario on, on the willingness of government to, uh, to make changes and, and, and that vision they have uh, for better governance uh, inside within government. Um, so with that, again, I'd like to thank all of our speakers. Uh, as I close the, the Q&A, uh, thank you, Dr. Ron Mendoza, Dr. CP, Dr. Uh, Dr. Justine uh, Jokmusikat, uh, Mr. Habitan, and Mr. Dagasari for, for sharing your insight and time with us this morning. Uh, as I close the, the q and I'd like to now turn the mic back over to none other than Professor Dean de Manhit, the president of uh, Stratbase ADR Institute for his closing remarks. Professor Manhit. Thank you, Paco. Again, it's been a good two hours uh, listening to public intellectuals, our partners in the private sector. It's been our desire uh, in, in Stratbase to really bring people together, even at the height of the pandemic. That's why we came up with this idea of virtual town hall discussion. Thank you for our authors for helping us come up with policy papers. Thank you for the private sector, always being part of us. And thank you for the participants, stakeholders of Philippine society that are always important in any of our advocacy in the ADR Institute. I'd like to read a simple statement. As I look at this challenge of inequality, how can we bridge that inequality gap? How can we achieve that inclusive goal? We know for a fact that a few months mm -hmm. from now, June 30, the Philippines will have a new president, a new chicken executive, a new head of government who will inherit the enormous task of addressing all the socioeconomic challenges of Filipinos on the ground, more especially the widening inequality gap induced by two years of this pandemic. However, the country's next administration would need to exert a holistic effort for these challenges to be significantly addressed. We need a leader who acknowledges the important role the private sector plays in development especially through their investments across a wide range of sectors. These endeavors trigger a dominant effect by creating jobs, providing income security, spurring consumption, and real growth. Indeed, at this point in time, sustainable strategies must be pursued or the future generations of Filipinos can reap long-term benefits. But to attract more investment in the country, both domestic and foreign investment, the next government must uphold the rule of law, promote good governance, strengthen efforts in transparency and accountability, and ensure continuous political and economic reforms. When prospective foreign investments see that even domestic players show positive response to government initiatives, then they too will join in the pursuit for honest and collective growth. Our Filipino people deserve one of
of economic growth that is inclusive that will address this generational inequality that they've been dealing with. Again, good morning and thank you for everyone. Thank you, Professor. Bye. Thank you. 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 Happy. Mr. Popoy. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Dr. C.P., Dr. Ron, always thank you for being part of us. Bye-bye. <laughs>